a moment and just do a, a biographical sketch of a historical figure. And uh, I want to do that with a, with a character by the name of John Quincy Adams. Um, sixth president of the United States, the son of the second president of the United States, John Adams. Uh, John Quincy Adams is the sixth president. He's president from, he's a one-term president from 1825 to 1829. His lifespan runs from 1767 to 1848. So you can tell just in that span of time, here's a man who, who was a child in, at the infancy of our nation, is watching his father uh, frame the Constitution. He's watching his father's families and friends doing all that they can to establish documents and, and, and uh, papers that will govern this new, this new government. And uh, he's, an, he's an observer. So, so I, 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 at Christmas, Renee bought me this book, a uh, biography of John Quincy Adams, uh, an American visionary by Fred Kaplan. It's not necessarily, uh, it's really more written from a historian's position, a secular historian's position. He's, uh, I, I really haven't done any research on the author himself. You think maybe you've read a, a book or two or something by? I've read it. Oh, I got you. You've read another biography, which there's a lot of biographies out about. This one's fairly new, written in 2014. Um, but it just takes a, a, a very exhaustive look at his life. Uh, not so much his presidency. Many would argue that his presidency was a failed presidency. Um, and most of that, the reason I wanted to look at him this evening, use him as, as the, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to say it, and then I'm going to say it, so apparently I want to say it. Uh, use him as the whipping post for bad, for examples of, bad presidential election seasons, not necessarily because of him, but historians tell us that the election process, two election processes, his, his first election process was riddled with controversy and when, he's, when he's elected as president. When he runs for uh, the extension of his office for a second term, it is, it is a nasty blowout I don't know how, but how, how, how really to put as many adjectives to it as possible. But between him and Andrew Jackson, uh, an, an eight-year span of time, a great conflict between the two individuals. Quincy wins the first election in a controversial way, and will at least in a bypass address that. And then Jackson wins his attempt, uh, wins the, the next presidential bid, uh, which is Quincy's attempt to to have a second term, and he does so in as equal of a, a nasty way as possible. But surprisingly, everything that his, the historians tell us about John Quincy Adams, he is a man that wanted to obey his God. And so I just want to do a, a, a real simple biographical sketch. If anything, to whet your appetite, perhaps to either Feel free to borrow this book from me. I'm sure it's at the library. Get another. There's a. There's probably enough biographies written about John Quincy Adams that every one of us could go to the library and get one written by a different author. But I certainly want to at least whet your appetite of curiosity about him. Before we dig into the, the nitty gritty of this, let's be reminded what Scripture says to us about our leaders. Uh, in, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, you're, you're familiar with this. Uh, I know you are. In, first, in Proverbs chapter 29, in the second verse, and, and by the way, chapter 29 has multiple places it speaks to us about our leaders that govern over us. But this particular verse, I know that you're familiar with it in this respect because it speaks about the, whenever the righteous increase or when the righteous are in one can argue that the, the translation could read, when the righteous are in the majority, the people rejoice. And then the second half of that proverb is the opposite. But when a wicked man rules,
grumbles, people grumble. Now, argument can be made, people grumble, period. <laughs> Doesn't matter if it's a good ruler. What did the people do with Moses? They grumbled at him and they grumbled about their conditions. The, 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 the emphasis here is upon when there is a majority of the people are longing to walk righteously before God, there is a good day to live. But whenever we are being ruled by a wicked man or a wicked people or by the majority, the argument can be made here, the majority of the people are being ruled in their wickedness, the people Grown. And it appears as though what people who want godlessness to rule, they're saying, why are you making our lives so miserable? It's as though they're, they're, they're crying out to the righteous or to those who want to be ruled righteously. Who they, they just don't see that they're, they are actually reaping a common benefit or a common grace of God upon the whole of the nation. And they don't even see it. They really only see it as a restriction uh, of people who don't want them to do what they're doing. Well, with that in mind, obviously we, we're, we're full aware. We're in the throes of, in my lifetime, I, I've not paid this much attention to every presidential election, election in my life. Um, you know, I've, my, my days go, I, I, I can recall as a boy, especially um, Jimmy Carter's second attempt running for presidency and the landslide defeat by Ronald Reagan. Um, and of course there was lots of um, other issues related to that. But I, you know, I would have uh, President Johnson. Uh, I was a baby in those days, had no idea. Uh, Nixon, uh, when I read history, obviously here's a man riddled with conflict and controversy. Uh, Ford, um, uh, when you read about Ford in, in history, you, you get kind of a neutral character, but I wasn't really paying attention to Ford. Uh, and so maybe you can tell some good stories for me. Uh, and there's a lot written about Ford, but he's not, a, he's not an individual that many would, would necessarily go to and say, here's a standout president about something, but I don't want to take anything away from him in that respect. But, um, and then of course you have, you have characters like Ronald Reagan, um, who, as you, you will remember, whenever Ronald Reagan first begins to, to present himself as a legitimate politician uh, for a national candidate for presidency, people literally thought he was a buffoon and a, 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 a B-rate actor in Hollywood. And, um, of course, he, he proves to be one of the greatest presidents in my lifetime, arguably. Um, and, uh, and then you have uh, George H. Bush, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, George W. Bush, who is the second time that a father-son uh, presidency happens. And then now uh, an eight-year span, uh, soon to be, if the Lord tarries, an eight-year span of Barack Obama. When you look just in, in the last 50 years, though, historically, you can see a, a quick decay of the general morality of the nation and the landslide movement away from God is almost at neck break speed right now. Is there any possible way that the nation can be brought back? I will say that I'll make this argument on the front end. If we're looking to a president to do that, then we will be highly disappointed. The only way that a nation can be brought back from her decay of morality is if the church stands firm with the gospel, and the truth of who God is in calling people to repentance. But the church and her duty and her place is to be that, that part of the, of, of the culture to bring the nation back to God. So we're not looking for a president to do that. And uh, my, my, reason for, for doing this tonight is not to try to persuade or influence or uh, tip my hat to uh, one, one particular position or another. Um, you spend a couple of minutes with me, you'll find out pretty quickly where I stand and where I, if you read any of my blog posts, you, you'll even know quicker uh, my opinions on some things. 
Um, but let's let's at least take a, a, a journey back in history and give consideration to a a, a rather um, historically John Quincy Adams is not credited as being one of the great American presidents. He's, he's more known for things he does after he's a president, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. All right, so just some, some snapshot things here for you historically. And all, all, these, these things all come from, from my reading of this biography uh, by Ken Kaplan. He, uh, what, this is somewhat easy to grasp. What you and I would call primary school didn't really even exist in Adams' day, it, certainly not on a federal level. Uh, there, were no, there was no federal department of education, which always uh, perks up my ears when I hear politicians say they want to abolish the department of education. I say, that would be a great idea. <laughs> Please do so as quickly as possible. But he did not attend a formal primary school. He was essentially, um, before homeschooling was popular, it was normal. Uh, he was educated by his mom, uh, mostly in, in his primary days. And then as he uh, turns around the age of 10 and 11, he begins to travel with his father, uh, John Adams, who, uh, as you well know, is the second president of the United States. But he travels with him around the world. And he is educated and uh, has opportunity to be formally taught by his father while his father is doing about uh, international work. John Quincy Adams, um, at, at, at the age of 12, began journaling his life. We, we, don't have, uh, we don't have anywhere near the kind of documentation about any other president as much as we do about John Quincy Adams because he, in, 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 in volume case, and I went and looked, what is a, what would be considered a volume of pages? And it's roughly about, uh, this, this is about a 700 page, so anywhere from 550 to 600 pages would be considered a volume at this particular typeset. So his journals take up 50 volumes. Uh, so he was, he drafted and journaled and, and, and wrote about his life extensively, unlike any other president we've, we've ever had. Uh, take up 50 volumes of such. Most of his youth, as I just said, he was, he was at his father's side. Um, he was fluent in not only English, I should, I should include English, he was fluent in English, but he was fluent in French and Dutch. He was conversational in German and he studied Latin and Greek. And not only did he study those languages, but he even studied in those languages. He's a graduate of Harvard. He's a, he apprenticed as a lawyer and, and, and uh, then later practiced law in Boston. He, uh, uh, he is, this is a bit of trivia for you, uh, there is a presidential candidate right now running who's married to a woman, not married or not born in the United States, but that's really not all that original. Uh, John Quincy Adams was the first to be married to a woman not born in the United States. Um, Secretary, he, he served as a Secretary of State, which is in his day considered generally the prep office for the for the for person who will eventually run as president. It still is arguably, um, a, a, in, in lots of levels, a pretty influential office to hold that establishes someone for credibility for presidency later on. He uh, serves, so he serves as Secretary of State just prior to his being elected as president. He serves as president from 1825 to 1829. Um, historians make this argument. He's arguably the, uh, uh, has the highest IQ of any president that we've ever had. I, you know, I, I take that subjectively as to how the historians would make that kind of equation. Certainly, when you read uh, about him, uh, there's no argument that he was an intelligent person. And then uh, this would be, this would be the, perhaps you're familiar with the Amistad case. Um, this is essentially what sets up Abraham Lincoln's ability to free the slaves. This is a case that Quincy argues before the Supreme Court 
while he's serving as a as a, uh, as a representative in the House of Representatives, as a representative from Massachusetts. Uh, while he's doing so, his the last 17 years of his life, he serves as, as, as a representative of the House of Representatives. So that should tell you something else that's extremely rare about John Quincy Adams. Generally, when you hear about a president, he serves as president, and then you essentially never hear of him. Uh, it's, no one has ever done what Quincy John Quincy Adams did, and that is to go back and run for public office at the state level. Uh, he was, he loved his country, and he, he, he was a passionate uh, pursuer of God and a, uh, a defender of all human rights before it was popular. And not that Abraham Lincoln made it popular, it cost him his life, but he, this case, the Amistad African case, essentially sets up the case for Abraham Lincoln uh, to be elected and to eventually uh, have success in the Civil War. So uh, John Quincy Adams serves a short stretch. He, he, he is a lifelong, today, if, if he's on, the, if he's on the, the debate stage, he's, he's accused of being a lifelong politician. Uh, he's accused of being an insider uh, because he... He ran for nearly every possible public office you could run for and served at one stretch or another, either at the state level or the federal level. He, he served in the Federalist Party. He, he was in the Democratic Republican Party and then later in the National Republican Party, which is the party he wins his bid for the White House with. Afterwards, he runs uh, on a, for, a, for a governorship duty after he's run for president, a failed governor uh, bid on the uh, political party that he established called the Anti-Masonic Party. That says a lot. Yeah. <laughs> All by itself. That's a pretty narrow party, isn't it? Uh, and then uh, obviously uh, he's not the, he's not the uh, instigator or the starter, but he's, he also serves or runs some on the, uh, as one of the Whig Within, inside the Whig Party, um, which is eventually the, the, the formation of what, what would be called today the Republican Party. You, you realize the Republican Party is really a fairly new party uh, within, within our nation's history. Um, but the, the ideals are not new at all, the party. So. Um, listen, here's some things that, that John Quincy Adams did while he was uh, both outside of the presidency. All of this is outside of the presidency. We don't have really, we don't have very much at all to say this is the success he had while being president. But he drafted the Treaty of Gant, or uh, yes, in, in 1812, which is the treaty that ended the War of 1812. He negotiated the eventual um, border disputes with Canada. He negotiated with Spain for the annex of Florida. He drafted the Monroe Doctrine, you ought to uh, go back and read that and be re refreshed and reminded of the Monroe Doctrine. He, uh, he negotiated and, uh, and, and acted a plan to pay off most of the nation's debt. Um, so we, we're a nation that's always had debt, and arguably uh, historians will say every nation has debt. Um, uh, our debts early on were, were debts to to liberate us uh, for nations that would come and help us to fund our armies or helping the establishment or breaking free from, from Britain. Uh, John Quincy Adams stands at a unique place in history. Whenever, uh, when, when you think of John Quincy Adams, by the time Abraham Lincoln is elected president, all of the founding fathers are dead by Abraham Lincoln's day. But you have, you have John Quincy Adams that essentially stands as, a, as an in-between or, if you will, a bridge that historians would, would kind of put him in this position. One who is all, George Washington is really the one who encouraged Quincy Ad, or John Adams to make sure to take the boy with you. This boy is, is he's, he's intelligent. Take him with you as, as much as you can. He encouraged his father to appoint him to ambassadorships. He served as an ambassador to the nation of Russia. They didn't use the term ambassador, but John Quincy Adams served along with his father and alongside of his father 
essentially as a representative of the United States while he's abroad. And, uh, and, and so uh, John Quincy Adams stands in this place in history at, connected to Abraham Lincoln, the, the, the great Abraham Lincoln. And oh, hey, there we go. I think I killed it. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, man. I hope it, I hope it's still working. Um, so he's he's in this position where he has he has personal contact with all of the founding fathers, and then he has personal contact with again arguably at least the most popular American president outside of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln. It's a fantastic person figure in history. But yet again, his presidency, what's, what's, what's going on in his presidency? Why is it so, what appears to be so failed? Uh, the historians all note that John Quincy Adam would arrive, would, 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 would awake around five o'clock every morning and read the Bible. He, he, would, he would devote himself to devotions and spiritual time. He would walk uh, various times of his life, changing and making differences and distances that he would walk. But in his walks, he would take his Bible with him and he would read and he would stop and read and memorize and meditate upon scripture. And, and it, it actually influenced his, uh, his political office at state levels and federal levels. But again, his presidency, what, what's going on inside of it? Uh, well, if, uh, if, you, if you take a few moments and just do a little historic research and find out the kind of, of, of antics that were happening around his bid for the presidency. This is interesting. In 1824, where, whereas he's uh, making his presidential attempt to, to, uh, for the office of presidency, which, by the way, he is essentially uh, coaxed into doing, he doesn't really, when, when, as, when you read his, his memoirs, uh, in the excerpts, I haven't read all 50 volumes of that, so I don't, I don't mean to imply that I have by that. But the little excerpts that are included in his biography here, anyway, you get you get the understanding that he loved his country, but he didn't want to serve in the position of office. But people wanted him to. And so, uh, as as and his, his father was a big influence upon that in his life. And so eventually, he decides to do so in, in 1824. There's four people. Uh, you'll recognize some of these names, John Calhoun, Henry Clay, William Crawford, and Andrew Jackson. So there's, there's five people running for the office of presidency. And they're not running, this, these aren't primaries. These are five people that are on the ticket to be elected as president. Uh, Andrew Jackson wins the popular vote. And he has more electoral college votes than anyone else, but he doesn't. He's unsuccessful in achieving enough electoral votes to be elected president. And so by our documents of the nation, then it's, it's in that kind of a, of a contested race, it goes to the House of Representatives. Well, in the House of Representatives, the Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, uh, at that time, he is the Speaker of the House, and he weighs in on the election of the presidency. He was no fan of Andrew Jackson. That's very clear from all his short positions. Um, but uh, John Quincy Adams is in the third place. Um, uh, he comes in third with popular vote and second electoral votes uh, in the way that that works out. <clears throat> But when it came down to time for the House of Representatives to essentially elect the president, uh, Henry Clay weighs in on, on, on it. He has to recruit himself because he's running for office. And so he can't serve as both candidate for presidency and speaker of the House. And so it's now a three-way race between uh, a four-way race. Excuse me. They, 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 they select the top three. So it's Andrew Jackson. Uh, John Quincy Adams and Crawford, in, uh, William Crawford, that run that, that the House of Representatives are going to weigh in on and vote. Well, this is what sparks the great 
problem, the great eight year or four year problem for John Quincy Adams, because everyone expected that Andrew Jackson would naturally be elected because he had the popular vote and he had more <coughs> electoral votes than all the other candidates. But, his, but John Quincy Adams' friend, Henry Clay, Speaker of the House, declares John Quincy Adams as the president. Well, you can just imagine what that does to a guy like Andrew Jackson. You should read a biography on Andrew Jackson someday and, uh, and be surprised, both good and bad, of him. But essentially, John, er, uh, John Quincy Adams is plagued with a gentleman by the name of Andrew Jackson for four years. Everything that, that John Quincy Adams attempts to do as president Andrew Jackson stands to rally the troops against the president, not military troops, the political troops, and puts a stop to nearly everything that John Quincy Adams attempts to do in his presidency. It's in his second bid for the presidency that one could argue is the nastiest of all nasty political campaigns in American history, maybe with one new exception. We don't know. We'll have to see how that will weigh against it in history. Uh, in that case, or in that in that run, in that bid for presidency, uh, a rumor is broke that John Quincy Adams has a secret about Andrew Jackson. And you read the excerpts from Quincy's memoirs, and you, you'll find that this is a great regret of Quincy, John Quincy Adams. And that is that he, he, he broke news that uh, Andrew Jackson was married to a woman who was, a, who, who was married to other people, um, who was married to another man. And so, of course, that just created great controversy. Uh, it wasn't enough controversy to keep Andrew Jackson from being elected president, but it was a nasty um, little bout of time. Andrew Jackson does win the bid for the presidency and, uh, and, and, and serves arguably a fairly successful bid in the White House. But uh, there's a lot of other strange and bizarre things in that, in that candidacy for president for John Quincy's Adam attempt for a second bid, but he didn't disappear uh, in, into presidential a bid. <coughs> He runs for the House of, as for a seat in the House of Representatives. He wins that bid and stays there for the rest of his life. He spends 17 years uh, as, as a representative. And as I shared with you earlier, you should do some research on the Amistad African case that he, that he uh, argues before the Supreme Court and wins in a very controversial era. This is pre-Civil War. This is generations. Uh, Andrew, and John Quincy Adams is an old man whenever Abraham Lincoln as a young man shows up uh, in, in federal uh, uh, workings. Uh, but they do serve together and do have some interactions. And history has a few uh, occurrences of their conversations. But before... Before the nation is about to be split apart by civil war with Abraham Lincoln, John Quincy Adams takes a, <coughs> takes a case before the Supreme Court that no one expected for him to win. And that was to defend slaves who, uh, who took over their slave ship. And uh, their slave ship eventually came to rest on American soil. They get, they get off the boat and they're arrested and put in jail. Uh, and uh, it's a nasty, it's a horrific uh, just tale. Um, I, 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 I'll mention the movie, and I'll mention it with caution. It's an, it is an R-rated movie, and I don't like to promote R-rated movies. And I don't mean to, to sound as a promoter of them. It's rated R because of the language and because of the, the graphic detail of the suffering that the slaves endured, both on the boat and in jail when they get to America. Um, but it is a case of unprecedented. It's, I think it's the, I, can't, I don't know if I remember the exact name of the movie, but uh, Steven Spielberg is the director of it, surprisingly. It's a, it's a miraculous story. I think it's just called Amistad. Uh, 
Yeah, it's, it's, you should at the bare minimum go to PBS and read and watch how PBS has documented that case. It is spectacular. John Quincy Adams is a lover of freedom. He's a lover of his God and everything he does is influenced by his relationship with God. And I think that what, what an argument could be made from a guy like John Quincy Adams, even though history would not paint him as a successful president, I think history will make argument for this case that the people rejoiced when the righteous were in the majority. The people rejoice whenever there is a man like John Quincy Adams who is in position to save them. I can certainly tell you this, the Amistad slaves would be nothing but rejoicing at the righteous stand of John Quincy Adams. This is this amazing character in history. I, I commend you and, and encourage you to read all that you can about John Quincy Adams. And to weigh that into consideration of, a, of these couple of verses in, in uh, Proverbs chapter 29, the one we've already read, John, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 2. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, people groan. And then move over to the 12th verse of that same chapter. If a ruler pays attention to falsehood, all his ministers become wicked. Isn't that, I mean, it's almost make the case, Paul, why didn't you just get up tonight and read verse 12 and pray and let's go home? That's, that's pretty powerful and profound, isn't it? When a ruler pays attention to falsehoods, all his ministers become wicked. So listen, as, as you're praying, or, and, and I was so grateful to be, in, in, to be reminded, I, I misspoke this morning to say that we'll all, you know, with whatever party you're in, you're going to the polls this week on Tuesday to uh, elect your candidate. And the, the Democrats in Idaho don't do so till later in the month. Um, Tuesday is the Republican primary. But ask whatever party you're a part of, and you know, I, I, there's no secret in my household. I, I do not belong to it. I do not officially belong to a party. Uh, I'm on the verge of joining the Constitution Party, um, but that's, uh, that's that's probably me digging into more politics than I need to. But it certainly puts me in position um, to, to 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 plead with God to help me. As I decide, how, how do I engage myself in our, in our politics? And it's not so much the party as it is my engagement with my God in the nation. When I, when I, as I shared this morning, when, as I think about how can, I, how can I help not only my mother, but how can I help myself in preparing for the, the eventual nomination and, and the election to come up in November of next year. How, how, do, how do I pursue in scripture? I, I, I'll let Proverbs 29 verse 12 certainly be a big part of some of that governing part for me. If a ruler pays attention to falsehood, all his ministers become wicked. What kind of a person will I, will I vote for? I'll, I'll prayerfully ask the Lord to help me. Vote for an honest man. Vote for a just man. Vote for a humble man. Vote for a faithful and a true man. He may not win, but that my duty is not to elect a winner. My duty is to vote my conscience. My duty is to vote according to the benefit of the whole of the nation. If the righteous would, would rule, it would be a blessing to them all. And then whenever rulers pay attention to falsehoods, well, they surround themselves with even more corrupt people as well. Well, what what thoughts do you have? Both about maybe anything you know about John Quincy Adams that uh, I, I uh, kept out of the bird's eye view of, of this great man of history. Uh, or if you have a comment to make just in general. <clears throat> John Quincy Adams was one of those guys that Realize what a miraculous thing that the formation of this country was. I think so. And he put his whole life in that. I, I agree with you, Chuck. 
Another good scripture I found here is Proverbs 28, 9 and 10. Read it out loud. Anyone who turns his ear away from hearing the law, even his prayer is detestable. The one who leads it upright into an evil way will fall into his own pit. But the blameless will inherit what is good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Is it, is it true that he had just a, a phenomenal memory? He had to memorize a lot of the scriptures. He did. Yeah. Which I think is, is one of the reasons why they put him in such a criteria of having the greatest IQ of any uh, U.S. president. But a phenomenal memory. Which probably aided him a lot in his, in his legal work. You know, many years ago, uh, there was an election, presidential election, and and I had my eyes on a third party candidate at the time. This is it. Probably when I first voted, I guess. And was told that uh, if I didn't vote for the major party candidate, I was wasting my vote. And to vote for the lesser of two evils. I think for us to even vote for evil is a, is a mistake. And I, the scripture I, I look at <clears throat> is in Romans, Romans chapter 13, verse 1. It says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And I think we're called to vote for a godly individual, and the, the consequences are up to God. You know, and we can't vote for evil. We really can't. I mean, it's a censure. We're going to vote for Ahab, or we're going to vote for Jehoram, you know, uh, Jeroboam. Right. Or, they're both evil. How do you dare say that's the king I want? Yeah. Neither one of them are going to be any good for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, I, I think there's a there in, in the two party system, and I'm no I'm no political expert, so I hope you're not taking it. I'm I'm really a political commentary who, who gives his opinion about politics. That's really all I am, his opinion giver when it comes to politics. But the argument. Is that if 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 you're not voting for one of the two major candidates, your vote is essentially for the lesser or for the greater of the evil, uh, rather than for the lesser of the evil. And I think that's a bully tactic to get you to vote for a, for a candidate that is not one that you would vote for. I get I understand the philosophical argument that perhaps that's true, but I'm owned to my conscience. I'm owned to my God that I must vote my conscience. And can I at all vote for evil at any level? Well, we should all vote. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, I really appreciated some conversations at, at lunch today with the men, both uh, during and, and some extended time afterwards. And uh, I, I've, re I've read recently at this astronomical, it's, it's almost, you just want to go out and find every Christian you can. Say, are you seriously sitting at home on election day? It's estimated. Now, whatever the definition in these polls are, this is, this is a problem inside of this, but they estimate around 25 million Christians didn't vote in the last election. You ought to vote. Now, we'll all, we'll, would all 25 million of them voted for another person? Probably not, because we don't really know the definition of what they're meaning. But isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. John Quincy Adams election, the, the polls or the, the results of it show that only one third of the nation voted whenever he was elected president. The apathy of the ele of the potential electing people is one of our miserable markers on our nation. A nation that can vote doesn't really care about it. I think the polls of the Christian world today is, is also that politics is going to be brought into the church. Yeah. And Everything is under the dominion of God yeah. and of His Word. Yeah. And you look at our revolution. In many historians call it a pulpit revolution because it was it was taught in the pulpits of the land, well, and it was debated in the pulpits of the land, yeah. going against a, a governing authority, the British. Yeah. But uh, there's a place in, in the church also for discussions about politics. I mean, and let, letting letting some of the I mean. Trying to decide what laws we're challenged with as Christians 
from the governing authority because that's a challenge to think about. It really is. Yeah. It really is. Well, that's a great segue. I really appreciate you setting me up for that, Chuck, because next Sunday night, I want to take a look at the three uh, jurisdictions that God's given to the nation. Government jurisdiction, church's jurisdiction, and the family's jurisdiction. And so we're going to, I've already got the outline laid out. We're going to go there. We are really going to go there <laughs> and talk about the government's jurisdiction, the church's jurisdiction, and the family's jurisdiction. And, uh, we'll find we're going to put into each category where where does education belong? What jurisdiction does that fit? Um, where does caring for the poor and the needy? Well, whose duty is that? Whose jurisdiction is it? Uh, whose job is it to solve to, to settle legal cases? Whose job is it to pick up the sword? Uh, well, some of those are really easy, but you're going to find out. You already know this. Uh, your government, my government is slowly, but now it's quickly taking them all up, claiming them as their own jurisdiction. And that's a scary place, a scary game. Well, before long, I'll, I'll go ahead and finish next week's. <laughs> Let's pray.